I've made my living off of Bandcamp. I don't have to go to a day job because of Bandcamp. Bandcamp didn't exist, I'd have a job. What's up, guys? Welcome to Metal Forge Reviews. We have a very special episode for you guys today. We interviewed Trevor Church of the killer heavy metal band Haunt. They just released Beautiful Distraction, and it's easily one of our favorite albums of 2021. Link in the description to Haunt's Bandcamp to grab your copy. We're starting a new series here on artistic achievement, where we interview the artists directly who are successful in the modern music and metal scene about where they are today. We hit the importance of merch, making your brand, maintaining your social presence and why Bandcamp made Haunt the Beast it is today. If you like content like this, hit that like and subscribe button. It really helps us develop the channel and continue to make videos like these. Let's throw it over the interview. It seems like not so long ago, I was obsessed with your last records, Mind Freeze and Flashback, where, you know, multiple releases later, you've got your new album, Beautiful Distraction. Congrats on that release, by the way. It's easily your best work yet. Can you tell us a little bit about what makes Beautiful Distraction? a significant step in the right direction for Haunt compared to your earlier work? Absolutely. So the first thing when I got into doing Beautiful Distraction is I did a re-recording of my EPs to test some audio equipment, test some other gear that I had going on. Because if you do it DIY and you record it in your, yourself, you need to kind of have something to go off of and something to fuck up a little bit. You know, you're like, okay, well, this might not be exactly what I'm looking for, but it's close. So I did a little pre-engineering work, mic placement, different mics, and I did that with that. That's the first step of it because I think it is my best production. I would have to say like sonically, it's pretty decent. Like it has the low end thunder. It's got a big kick sound. And that's all due to the pre-engineering part that I did. So it's good to take a song or, or an album, <laughs> in my case, an album, but you could do it with one or two songs just to like something that you already have so when you hear it back, you could be like, okay, this sounds pretty fucking rad. I'm gonna go with that. And so I kind of got myself prepared sonically before I started working on the album. And one thing that was really great about it was n knowing I could spend more time on the parts because I wasn't gonna be teaching anybody. I hadn't, I hadn't really had to do that since Mind Freeze at this point. We're talking about beautiful distraction. I really just got to focus way more on having strong vocals. I'd go back and back and, you know, trying to go like, all right, well, step it up. Always try to kind of outdo yourself of your last thing. Be like, try harder. Even if the songs may not be my best songs or whatever, I'm gonna try to sing it better and I'm gonna try to play it better than maybe, maybe I did in the past. And really pushing myself in that way. But you know also if you're in a studio i feel like it's a lot harder to get that sometimes because you're you're working against time and i could just sit here and and make a ton of mistakes and and basically try experiment at the same time it's something i wouldn't feel as comfortable in the studio doing i i feel like there was like a lot of growth in that not letting myself get held back by past things past thoughts like no rules this time i'm just gonna try to figure out what goes best here and also overall like how i write songs now has is a lot stronger i feel so when you get to like newer material um i only did six new songs on on this technically two of them were on a seven inch that long sold out and i really liked both the songs and i felt like they were wasted i was like ah especially sea of dreams i feel like it just it just has something i really like i can't leave this on a fucking seven inch that's dead like i want people to fucking hear it okay like i want people to be able to access it and my approach with beautiful distraction was really just play better everything take a look at it before saying all right i'm done like listen to it back and be like nope those drums nope you got you got to step it up there especially being like me being the drummer on it having to overcome my own limitations and also kind of crafting it to myself. It's because it's like, all right, well, if I could play it, you better be able to play it. If you're not on the same page as me, I'm playing drums, bass, guitar, get the fuck out of here. I could get behind the drum set and be like, this is actually how that part's played. Like, play it how I want. I just really put a lot of thought into just playing well. That is the success on time everything like even cutting things out just no bullshit like nothing that's 
that overstays its welcome. I think that's kind of been the key to the success of my music. I could do like slow rock, heavy rock songs. I could do some thrashy stuff and I could do mid tempo stuff all day but you know all even though i have these variations and tempos and style it's still kind of all kind of sounds similar it's really important not to over extend it to the point where it's like all right i'm tired of this fucking shit make it brief four minutes maybe four and a half but even i'm starting to realize like three is okay right. you know i used to think like heavy metal songs you got to make it as long as you fucking can that's a the long solo that go, you know, even that gets cut because I'm like, you know what? I got a big ambitious goal of 20 albums. I can't be happy. Like, I, if I'm going to do epics, I got to save it for a later time when it makes more sense. No fat on it, right? None. You pride yourself on burning the midnight oil. Pretty much everything, you know, is DIY. You're the primary songwriter, as you just said, the audio engineer, the owner of Church Recordings. Can you tell us what about wearing all of these hats, how that has made a huge difference for you and Haunt staying relevant in the metal and rock scene? When you put yourself in a, a leader role, it's important to understand all the aspects of what that really means. The first step is just the song. You need to have a good song that people are gonna like, a catchy song. The second, you need to have your, your, your merchandise needs to be good. You gotta look at your stuff and be like, would I wear that? I'm wear, I wear my own fucking shirts, man. I mean, like, I'm, I look at my shit as like, this is my brand. I don't fuck, it's not like, some people think that that's not, it's taboo, but I'm like, you know how much money I spent on these fucking shirts, <laughs> motherfucker? I'm broke because of these goddamn things. I have I have a stacks of t-shirts at my house. I just grab a shirt. <laughs> you know, I don't think about it and go like, oh, it's going to taboo. No, wearing my own shit. To, to the point of it, it, you know, having your merch real solid, super important. And then the next step of that of importance is, you know, your social media needs to be really good. Now you can focus on, you know, if you, if you kind of have those things in place, you can start focusing on just recording albums and whatnot. It is really hard. And sometimes I actually ship stuff to people too. So I'm a shipping department. So I run the online store as well. Wow. It's, there's never a dull moment here. And I'm a dad, if you could even <laughs> believe that. So life is like, I like to be, I, I work better under pressure. Um, I like, if, if, if things aren't hard, I don't feel like I'm doing it, doing enough. I want to be pushed. I think most people get like that in a job eventually. You start getting too, you know, you're like not being pushed anymore. The job starts to suck. It's, it's tedious, it's repetitive. But when you make it really hard and you give yourself challenges to overcome, perhaps, that gives you that extra bit of appreciation, drive. And then also we are talking about good decisions. You don't make a bad decision like signing your music over to some indie label for five grand and they get a 10 year license. I can just make my record myself. So now you could just go direct to consumer. Wearing all these hats, makes you a lot stronger of an individual. You're gonna have more success because you're you doing it yourself. You don't wanna let yourself down. You wanna make sure you're fucking on top of your game. It really pushes you to have to be. So with that said, what would you say to a, a young musician that is starting out right now, they have a simple at-home rig, they got a guitar, they got easy drummer or something. What would you say to them, you know? What would you say to yourself if you were to go back and talk to, you know, teenage Trevor or how would you approach things? The first thing I would tell them, I mean, this is going to sound ridiculous, is just to never touch alcohol ever. <laughs> that sounds ridiculous, but like a lot of my 20s, I spent just like drunk and wasting my time and you can't get that time back. So the first thing I would say is just really use good judgment in the rock and roll world. If you're going to try to have self-made success as a DIY recording engineer and songwriter you, you have to do it every day and that time you would have spent hanging out with your friends that time gets spent working on music i have no social life whatsoever zero i don't ever go the only place i go to is a restaurant that's it i don't go to bars i, I sometimes i'll go to shows but that's not really been relevant lately i would say i think we all start off with we 
learn how to program drums and stuff, but I think if you're gonna be a sole songwriter, I think it's important to learn how to play all the instruments. That way you're not you're not reliant on other musicians to come in to get the job done for you, especially if you don't have a band. If you have a full band, then you're gonna be on your way. You need to make sure you have good microphones. You're not gonna have, that's the first step. If you don't have decent microphones, you're already shot yourself in the foot. You can get away with using a cheaper computer and a cheaper interface, but what you can't get away from is a cheap mic. And also is sound absorption. I don't know if you guys can even see, but I got fucking foam everywhere in here. Bass traps, like you you want to deaden your space, especially because you got to realize that you're not in a state-of-the-art studio that's built for acoustics. You want basically a dry room. You want to fucking dry that shit out. Use as much foam, blankets, whatever you have, carpet, but do not record in a room with none of it. It will be bad. And uh, let's face it, we're all it, like your DIY 15 year old engineer. You don't know what sounds good. You have to kind of, you know, read about it and listen to people. And then it's trial and error. Your first shit is not going to sound great. You can't stop. It's a rabbit hole. I mean, I have like my rig in here has changed so much <laughs> over the years. Like it's if you're going to go down that road, you need to always remember to invest in your you're investing in you so any money spent is not money wasted if you have a real dream you know it's like I want to be everything I have I, I want to be a producer engineer all of it I actually I just enjoy the creation of music creating it is what drives me so it doesn't even just have to be me it could be other people I enjoy being part of the creation I'm allowed to make a living because of Han. You gotta get a good computer, a good interface, and you can really do a lot. More people are gonna be doing this soon because you can't afford studios anymore. It's hard because like guitar oriented music is not top 40. Indie labels don't have a lot of money. So when they give you a budget of 20, I mean, I've seen budgets thrown at bands for like $2,500 for a full length album. And I'm like, that's, that's not gonna get you very far. Right. You can't even fucking get your album mastered. <laughs> you know, with somebody decent, it, it could be up anywhere from 100 to $300 a song. And you know, like you got 10 songs, you didn't even yeah. get it mastered. Right. So, so you're gonna get an incorrect piece of shit work for 2,500. So if you got that budget, what you do is you take that $2,500, you go get an iMac, and then you get yourself a Apogee Quartet or something. You gotta, you gotta start somewhere unless you got some money, you could get a actually good eight channel um, interface. But that's what I did. So when I did Beastmaker's first record, they gave me 10,000 bucks and 5,000 of it was for the recording. And the other $5,000, I, I wish I wouldn't have done this now, but that was for, they have full publishing. I gave, I gave them the publishing rights. So like, I don't really get any royalty off any publishing for Beastmaker's first record. Oh. Mm -hmm. So that's okay. I look at it as it got me started. You know, I needed, I needed, I needed a loan. One of the things that we tell our viewers all the time is, especially if you're a new band, is to know your audience and focus on your niche, which is something I feel like you've sort of touched on and do really well. Can you tell us what you do to connect with your fans and how have you focused Haunt to be the success the band is today? So recently I discovered a couple things. One, Facebook algorithms are a huge challenge. They really present some issues when you try to post content in Certain content doesn't get as much likes or not a lot, not a lot of people see it. Cause I was like wondering, I'm like, why does this have this many and this, this, they're not any like cooler posts. You know what I mean? I'm like, what gets people to engage? <clears throat> in doing that, I thought, okay, I'm gonna start a like vinyl club type ordeal. This dude I know, Martin from the Czech Republic was like, let's do, I'm gonna set up a Facebook group for Haunt and it'll be people that wanna be in this vinyl club and we'll talk about stuff and like we were, it was going to be this like interactive like thing where I was going to show people the songs beforehand you know recording them and whatnot the focus of the page sh shifted to like a fan club page and one thing I noticed immediately is like interacting with these people really like made the internet a better place for me I was like okay it's not my personal page anymore where you have 
politics and all these opinions. Now I have this like music community that re revolves around haunts and what my fans are into, what they like, who they are. And that has been really rad for me. So I, I, I don't know if every band could do that. <laughs> I just, I think you could to be involved in it like I have been. I post in it every day. I make sure I go in and, you know, I'll, even if it's just a picture of a show from somewhere we played, like, yo, we're here, this, you know, whatever. Yeah. Like just having some sort of content content to interact with people with. That is like really, I'm like really involved in my, my, my fan stuff because not like I know everybody's names because I ship them records. I'm the shipping guy. Yeah. So, I mean, you can't tell me when I click on Bandcamp and I see like, uh, I can name drop him. This dude, Keith Putnam. This dude has everything I've ever done times two. No well, shit. What a good dude. He's a collector. And if you go on the fan club page, you'll see there's a lot of collectors. I have a lot of people that collect my, my vinyl work, they collect the t-shirts. It's really good to know who your people are and you're connecting with them. To me, it's like every artist should give 20 minutes of time to the person that supports who they are. I think that gets lost in rock and roll. Dude, and, and it feels like nowadays with the digital age and everything, back when, you know, in the 70s, if you listen to Led Zeppelin, there was no, like, you were on Earth, they were in the stratosphere. But here, like, in the digital age, like, somebody looks at you and they're like, oh my God, I love Trevor Church, he's a rock star. They can just hit you up and be like, hey man, love your last album. I think that really makes people feel important and less of like a, oh, I'm a consumer, this person just needs my money, and actually part of, like, the experience. Yeah, I think more artists need to make sure, like, I've definitely been disappointed a few times, and I mean, and I'm me. So I can imagine, like, Joe Blow, like, giving somebody a compliment over the internet and they don't get a response. They're like, you know, you kind of don't think that they're going to respond, but, like, when I get disappointed when I meet, or I try to reach out to people and I, I get no response, I'm kind of like, well, fuck you then. <laughs> well, no response is a response. You ain't got time for a compliment, like, Maybe you aren't that cool of a dude, you know, but that's just me. Some people you could go, oh, whatever, they're, you know, you could look past it. And I do all the time, I'm sure, right? There's, but there's been a few artists that like I, I thought really highly of until I tried to talk to them or just see like, you know, and, and they don't even give me the time of day. I'm like, well, do you want to have a guitar battle and see who wins? <laughs> You're that much better than me. You can't even just say fucking hi. Thanks. I'm not even looking for like a, friendship or even a conversation thank you one thing i could definitely say with quite a lot of confidence is that i really do take the extra time to talk to everybody they leave me a note on Bandcamp. you get a note back that's awesome man do like a letter and put it in their fucking thing but if they're like dude look you know they say something in the note i type back i give them a response because i mean I gotta ship this stuff pretty quickly, so I don't have time to go like, thank you, hand note, put it in there. Yeah. I do sell a lot of records and I'm independent, so a lot of it you have to get from me. You can't get it anywhere else. Yeah. So it makes me way busier. Also as an independent DIY person, you need to actually put aside some time for research and development. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, you don't know it all. So you need to always take a little time out of your day if you're like, well, what are the benefits of using Spotify? Like, what are they telling you to do? I paid my money to go into the commercial digital world. It's getting sent here. Now, what do I do with it? Do I even need to do anything with it? Mm -hmm. How to, how, you know, so I'm looking at it and I'm like thinking they're gonna have this like actually really educational shit. And I'm like, no, there's literally nothing. Like you just upload it and it's there. You yeah. can't do anything to really make it better other than be like, here, you could listen to it here. That's really it. That's the end. We've sort of said that, you know, you are an extremely prolific person. You write amazing metal material. You consistently have a strong presence in metal press and blogs. What advice could you give to newer bands to reach out to bigger names in metal blogs and get coverage and get their name out there? And how can they stand out from other bands? There are only a, a few like larger artists that I really did reach out to. Um, I've had some help from Joel Grind from Toxic Holocaust because he is basically uh, he does the same thing as I do records all his own shit and plays all of it so 
who better to get advice from, but you just have to ask sometimes for, if you're trying to get some, you know, if you want to be on a, a blogger's page or something, I guess I, I, I really just kind of fell into it. People tend to just, uh, just do it for me automatically. I think what it comes down to is you need to like, again, you need to spend time researching and development in, in music. So now you're studying bands and studying genres and try to find somewhere where you fit in there. Like what you really, like you can do that, but you. I have a lot of influence in California music, like the Southern California punk stuff. And I incorporate that beat in my music all the time. Yeah. Even though it may not sound identical to like Pennywise or or No Effects or any of those type of bands, you know, my is a little bit more technical. I, I was like, you know what, this is kind of missing in the genre of heavy metal for me, and I'm gonna put it in there. A lot yeah. of double bass in metal, and that, but you don't go, yeah. you don't get that beat a lot. And so for me, it was just kind of trying to figure out things that I wanted to do that you don't hear as much in it. And that was one of them. You got to kind of just dig into who you are. It's so like being a musician, if you're faking it, people are going to really notice it or you're just yeah. going to come off as a copy. Now, if you're who you are truly, it's going to be hard to call bullshit no matter what. So I always say look deep at your roots of your music. Don't be ashamed that you maybe liked Janet Jackson. I love Janet Jackson. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah, well, I'm just see. I'm just saying. It's like, but there's like, there's like gatekeepers in metal, and there's like these high standards of what is. Metal. It's pretty. There's a lot of snobbery within it. Get that shit out of here. Yeah. Get it out of here. Ain't got no time. That get that mentality out. It's okay to be maybe throw some more rock style. I'm hearing a lot of bands that are like, really like it's borderline metal classic rock inspired stuff like that band Halas. I don't know if you guys yeah, know yeah. Those guys are great. I think they're like one of the best bands. They, they call it adventure rock. I'm like, I, yeah, I'm sold. And, they, and they're like kind of metal still. Because yeah. they have some parts where I'm like, this is Iron Maiden, Thin Lizzy type shit. Yeah, and it's their own niche, man. And you can tell they're selling it, and they're they're a great example. That's what I'm saying is like, you, you know, you do, you find what you do, like, from his side, they, they created their own little thing. For me, I, I don't look at myself as adventurous as Halas. I, I'm more of a, like, again, like a lot of my early roots in music are gonna re be around the punk scene because California had, we have thrash metal and we have punk. Yeah. You know, they, we got glam metal and shit, but like the only glam I like, glam metal I like is like early Motley Crue and Ozzy, that's it. Yeah. Like that's the sunset. A little docking. I'm sorry, docking. I was hoping you'd say docking. Yeah. God, I can't leave out docking. I mean, I, that's like one of my favorites. I can't even believe I got there. But I don't really look at them as Sunset Strip as much, though. I'm talking about California shit. So does that mean you're gonna write a ballad for one of your haunt songs eventually? No, I mean that's definitely the only reason it has it, it it hasn't happened yet is I haven't written one that I like. I haven't got there. I haven't figured out. It, it's hard. I'm. I, I am. I've been thinking about it. You gotta live life on the road and miss your family. That's. Yeah. I think that's the main thing. Stop being a dad for a while. It's really. It hasn't come naturally at all, and that's kind of what is big for me. Is like the natural part of like when the song comes out, I just write it out of thin air. You can't force these things. I can't go ballad. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> squeeze it out you know yeah. it's like if i'm to hit my 20 album goal i have quite a ways to go till i find it it's going to happen and i hope when it does happen it's going to be awesome because i'm not going to put it i'm not going to let it out unless it's unless it's okay yeah you have an amazing collection of merch we talked about it a little bit but want to dive into it a little bit more um you have a very distinct brand that you've developed you know from your first demo to now so what advice can you offer new bands that are developing their brand and should merch right now in 2021 should that be a significant focus for artists and bands i mean if you're weren't focused on merchandise you've already you should just and you're, you should just end it and go get a job. If we haven't learned from KISS how important merchandising is, you need to go take a look at what they've done and appreciate it because they 
their albums. Some would say, I, I don't think Kiss is the greatest band. Like there's people that think Kiss is the, the greatest classic rock band ever to walk the earth. But I think they have a lot of bad albums, but they have a lot of good shit though too. You don't get there from not being good. You have to have good music. But their merch is on point. Yeah. Merch just is fucking flames just coming out of everywhere. It's just on fire. They just, everything. I, my vision was a little bit different. I come from a, you know, again, like I'm a California guy. So I grew up skateboarding all over the place. I skateboarded since the early eighties. I started when I was a little kid. And when I was, a, a lot of what Haunt has to do with is a specific artist, his name Shepard Ferry. Uh, but he was like a skater and he was in the punk scene. And it's just overall, I'd always see his shit everywhere, that Andre the Giant face. I'd be skating in San Francisco and I'd be going underneath the bridge and I'd see fucking this giant Andre the Giant face. And I used to go, that shit is fucking tight. Like, and then I found out he was, he, you know, he actually did art for bands and stuff. And I always really like admired graphic design work. Cause it was like, you take something and you kind of manipulate it and you make it your own. It's now pop art, Andy Warhol. You know, those kind of things. So I'd say like, you, you learn from pop art a lot because pop art, like it's specific, it's noticeable and it's memorable. So the logo is huge. And I had the best in the business of graphic design as far as I'm concerned to do my logo. Cole Abron from Bronca Studio, he did the logo. And I think like he, when he showed it to me, I was just like, this is, best logo I will ever have. It's perfect, it fits anything. And then from there, it's just kind of more or less like, I'll have ideas of what I wanna see, like the flashback design, I wanted like an hourglass. I was like, I need an hourglass. I don't, whatever you wanna do around it, but we, we need to have this hourglass is gonna be the focal point. It's always been really simple. If you do a little, I mean, especially now, there's a lot more bands that do it than, than ever, but when Beastmaker started, it was just a handful of bands that were kind of doing it. Uncle Lasted maybe would be one, um, Electric Wizard, because that's kind of where I got all the ideas was off of old horror movie posters and things like that. Simple, like again, like we are talking about the Andre the Giant fucking face from Shepard Ferry, I took Vincent Price's space and I put it on the Beastmaker You Must Sin demo. I thought that was an homage of like everything that I was always like, I fucking love that. I don't know why. We, we should absolutely hit on Bandcamp really quick here because merch is your best way. It, it, it's your moneymaker. It's how, you know, Haunt keeps the lights on. You know, can you talk about the importance of Bandcamp and some things you've learned? with that platform first thing you need every artist needs to do with Bandcamp is if you're going to sign to a record label you want control of your bank camp page and you want 100 percent of the sales you need to be able to sell your own records on there because there's there's i already know this for a fact so i'm not even this is a fact there are labels that they're connected to the Bandcamp page and they ship out the records the band doesn't see that money it's probably going to some sort of recoupable or maybe you get a very nominal royalty. So when you're buying, and this is supposed to be direct, that's not direct. It's like, no, I need to make a living. You're an independent label. You're gonna, you're you're trying to recoup money and probably make money off commercial digital as a profit point. So the Bandcamp, it, that is your place to where it's like, well, we sell our record here. Like I sell my, my fucking vinyl is here. I can sell it directly to my fans and I don't have to share it with the fucking label because I bought it off them. They already got paid. You know what I mean? They sell you records wholesale, so they made their royalty. It's just better to purchase it directly from the artist instead of going to the, the, the record label page. Let's just put it really important now that that gets put in the contract because that's almost Bandcamp's mission statement. They're like, this is for the art. This is an artist controlled platform. That's right. it. You have control of your shit. We're just here. We, have, we host the page, we have everything set up. They have great analytics too, because if you get into actually having to pay taxes as a musician, they do a lot of bookkeeping for you. It's worth, it's worth giving them the 10%, I will tell you that. Because not only do they have this great platform for bands to have, and you know, it, Spotify could learn from this. Give the artists control. Mm -hmm. Let us put a store on there. 
you're paying us 0 0.003 cents. You can't really have any clickable links anywhere. Give us a fucking little like store link underneath it. Bandcamp yep. does that. So the first part of this is own it 100%. Don't give it away. Put it in your contract. If a label has a problem with it, later on to the next because you can yep. get they actually have something on there where you can campaign for your, your own vinyl you want your record on vinyl okay well here's a campaign sell this number many and oh, we get cool. it all made they do work so you don't need a fucking label to give you a nominal loan to put out a record this is fucking 2021 we live in a streaming era you don't have to have 10,000 records that have to go into all these distribution plants to go anywhere. It, you're, you literally could hand it to the person like like through the screen, basically. Second is to always try to like have some new content up there monthly, bi-monthly, but something, it could be small, it could be a fucking magnet. It could be a coaster. It could be anything because just, just get people to engage. You're like, here, I got like a new shirt design. Like how hard it is it? To get a shirt design made spend again we talk about investing in yourself Self is your band invest in those fucking t-shirts pay your art you know you gotta you gotta find artists that you work with that can get you a design in a week you're yep. like oh i want a design and then you have to go then you have to have your screen printing guy make it so you got to kind of be on the hustle you have to be getting shit done if you're not getting shit done you're not making anything I make a significant amount of my living off t-shirts. Significant. So it's real important, man, to like always be putting stuff out. And there's fucking crazy people like me. I collect shoes. Well, a specific shoe. And t-shirts. I have major t-shirt collection. Like a lot of people do. A lot of metalheads love that shit, man. Mm -hmm. T-shirts are fucking big money 20 years from now. Like, imagine having a fucking, you know, 20-year-old. 20 year old Def Leppard fucking tour shirt goes for 350. Aussie shirts, 300 bucks. You know, it's like, it's it's a real deal thing. It's branding and things. You gotta, that, that's your store. That's where you can make all those things happen. Mm -hmm. And every band needs to do that. I think the most important thing, again, is to not give it to the label. Be like, no, put it in your contract. Because if a small band, everybody's goal, I think, is to try to get signed, right? Is that the, all, like, that's the goal of a band. You start a band, you want to get signed, you want to have your records out. Unless you're going to be a fucking insane person like myself that wants to try to like somehow do all of it. And even I have people I collaborate with that help me along the way to get to where I need to go. I can't do it all alone. You always got somebody to you, you depend on to get you to some places. I could definitely tell you with 100% assurance that I've made my living off of Bandcamp. I don't have to go to a day job because of Bandcamp. Bandcamp didn't exist, I'd have a job. That should be a real reality of like how important it is and how important it is to plug that away before anything else. I like, I have albums not even on Spotify because I was like, I want to direct people to the Bandcamp. You can stream it for free there too. So it's like, Hey, you don't have to have this subscription. I think everybody should leave Spotify and go to Bandcamp and eradicate fucking just subscriptions until enough people really kind of join in on that revolution, which I think should happen. I hate Spotify. I argue with Apple Music people all the time. I love them over there, but they're like, nobody buys albums anymore. I'm like, if nobody bought albums right now, I wouldn't be fucking sitting here in a studio smoking a joint for work. Yeah. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like. Don't fucking try to tell me that streaming is taking over. Like people want people want that direct connection with the artist. You mentioned connecting with your audience. I want to give an opportunity for you to interact with some fans that posted on our page to ask some questions directly to you. This format is kind of rapid fire because there's a few questions here I want to get through. I'll just fire off a couple here. So the Metal Meltdown asked, how do you write so many banging tunes in so little time? What's your secret? My secret is just practicing all the time. If you get sit down and practice your guitar every day, uh, you're gonna write something. It's just bound to happen. That's the way I look at it. You grab it and practice, and you know you're gonna, you know, yep. magic happens. That is exactly how I, I do it. 
Blackwater Rust asks, what hot record are you most proud of? And what was the writing process like for the new album? Um, well, definitely, I think my favorite album right now to date is Flashback, only for a couple of reasons. It just, it was the first album I, I did alone entirely for, for Haunt. Like I, there's no outsider um, influence at all. The, the new writing process for, for a beautiful distraction, like I think we covered that earlier, is just, um, just starts out with the guitar riff, and then I, I just start building off the song that way. And I, I try to, like I said, is uh, the performance on this one, I try to really perform the best that I could. Like I really thought about it, made sure there was no mistakes, flawless, I practiced it. And um, I did it a number of different times before it was real solid material for me and that's that's that that really goes off of being a solo artist the band you would have to rehearse it with me it's like i rehearse to myself yep i have the drums there and i just play and i play and that was kind of the process is i i like again that almost goes back to the previous question sit down practice write a song it literally is that simple there is no there is no special anything more than me going, I need to practice today. Juniper asks, what albums changed your life and or inspired you and your sound? Albums that really have changed my life. I would, man, that's, that's a hard, that's a hard question because there's so many, there's been so many bands that like, obviously if people are familiar with me, you're going to hear a lot of Black Sabbath and Ozzy Osbourne influence in my music. And I would say that, the, the first Black Sabbath album had the most effect on over me than any other album ever. When I first heard Black Sabbath, I automatically knew they were the greatest band that ever walked the face of the earth, period. There's no, I could listen to it now, and I still feels like how I listened to it for the first time. Another one would be The Misfits, which was uh, Walk Among Us. Is mm -hmm. well, That was probably the first one that I heard, and then that really got me into Danzig, bringing me to Danzig One, which still is one of the greatest albums ever. Yep. I love fucking Danzig, dude. I'm Who does big, it? I have three Danzig tattoos, so we're talking about inspiration. If I fucking put you on my skin permanently, you're, you're <laughs> inspiration. So another one would be uh, Megadeth, and I got Rattlehead right here. <laughs> And that would be the Rust in Peace record because that that album pushed my guitar playing a lot. Oh yeah. Because I was just like, like, fuck, this is fast, it's technical, and it's one of a kind. Yeah. And it really, like, I studied that shit religiously. I used to be able to play it front to back. Now, fast forward all these years, I can't even remember how to play any of it all the way through. <laughs> and last question. What are your beautiful distractions in this crazy world? Well, definitely my wife and my kid. They distract me from, they, it's like a perfect utopia in here for me. So that, that really, um, I don't know. It's just like everything that's gone on, I, I, I've been basically distracted from it because I have such a good life here. Like it's weird. So um, that's what the beautiful distraction is. I love it, man. You deserve it. That's for sure. You worked hard for that life. Family is always number one over here, but especially with the church family, we're, we're a tight group of individuals. We love each other a lot and don't, we don't bring each other down ever. We always pick each other up. Thanks again to Trevor for the fantastic interview. Pick up Beautiful Distraction today if you haven't yet. It's a killer album, easily one of our favorites in heavy metal this year. As always, go with the gods, my Metal Forge brethren. Get after those goals and forge your future. Take care.